Good morning to everybody live and online. Sorry for the delay. It means that we <clears throat> will move ahead in 10 minutes and we will um, go to the end uh, 10 minutes after the uh, time is planned. So the first our speaker is uh, Austin Akiania from the Institute of Lithuanian Literature and Folklore. She is an ethnomusicologist and uh, her presentation is uh, Symbolical Events, the Centenary of Independent Republic of Lithuania and the 30th Anniversary of the Baltic Way. So uh, Austin, please. Hello, everybody. As a previous speaker, I also will speak about the creativity of citizens. Each country has a historical calendar of public holidays and memorial days. These days and celebrations mark the events most important and significant for the state and testify to the maturity and civic spirit of the society. When one remembers historical events, the symbolism of numbers is very important, and round anniversaries are celebrated more solemnly and universally. It is not surprising that the biggest celebration of recent years was 16th February of 2018, uh, the day when all the citizens of Lithuania rejoiced in celebrating on the 100th anniversary of their state. People flocked to the house of signatories to see the act of independence, which was signed a uh, hundred years ago. This historic document, its signatories and the hundred years of existence of the modern state were given special prominence and more festive symbols were remembered as well. Beside the festive dates, uh, there are also sad ones reminiscent of wars, occupations and repressions. Such an unfortunate year was 1939, when Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact was signed with its secret protocols. The day of the signing of the pact, uh, 33 August, uh, had for a long time been commemorated as a day of the Black Ribbon. On that day, Lithuanian emigrants would tie the tricolor with the Black Ribbon that symbolized the loss of independence. As the 15th anniversary of the signing of the pact approached, the awareness that it was time not only to remember this deal and in its consequences, but also to the mind the unknown grew. And on August in 1989, a huge socio-political action was organized. A human change joining Vilnius, Riga, and Tallinn, which receiving the name of the Baltic Way or Baltic Chain. It was more than commemoration of a historical date and more than just an event. According to one of the participants, the this was the road from which the fight for freedom began. People who dreamed for freedom a lot dared to take to the streets, held hands, and experienced unity and desire for freedom for the whole world to see and hear. The Baltic nations, three united sisters, want to create and live in freedom. After this political action, it was clear to the activists of the Lithuanian liberal liberation movement, Saudis, and the leaders of the Latvian and Estonian People's Fronts, that they had the support of their nations and uh, their activities became more and more purposeful. On the 11th March of the 1990, the restoration of the independent state of Lithuania was declared. And now about the anniversary, the year in the colors of the national flag. 
although it would seem that the calendar of public holidays is the same year, same every year, each of them is experienced differently. As a historical patriotic narrative is multi-layered and ambiguous, the, the celebrations acquire different semantic accents. In preparation for the 100th anniversary of the restoration of the Lithuanian statehood, President Dalagribuskaite called on citizens to celebrate in it joyfully and ingeniously. People in towns and villages responded to this call and not only took part in official festivities, but also pursued a variety of initiatives. In February, the most prominent urban buildings were illuminated in yellow, green, and red colors. Office halls and other public spaces were decorated with a variety of tricolor compositions. The windows of schools and libraries displayed paper, paper cut, cuts of flowers, birds, and hearts. On the day of the centenary celebration, the people who took to the streets wore flag-colored hats, scarves, gloves, and socks. People's homes were decorated in a similar way, and numerous families gathered at the festive dinner table wearing folk costumes. Seeing such a creativity in the interpretation of traditions, the idea sparked to accumulate a commemorative collection that would reflect the contribution, contribution of the participants in the celebrations. An invitation was publicized and sent to most beautiful uh, and sent to the most beautiful moments of commemoration to the Lithuanian folklore archives. Families and communities took pictures of their surroundings and were happy to send the images for archiving. They sent not only photos, but also videos that they had themselves filmed and edited. Hundreds of greetings posted on social networks were saved. I have already mentioned that the predominant uh, festive symbol was the Lithuanian state flag, but there are also other heraldic signs of Lithuania that occupied an important place. Gediminas columns, Vitis, the knight, and the double cross. There are some examples also held uh, important place in the cultural and educational institutions. The words of the national anthem, sun, love, light, true, strength, goodness, were common semantic highlights of, of the events. A long existence of the state was symbolized by a mighty branched tree. This image could be seen on stage decorations and also on postcards. In spring, many communities planted oak trees. People who celebrated their 100th birthdays were also honored. Continuity was emphasized by everything that is traditional and passed down from generation to generation, which resulted in numerous traditional artifacts. Today, country, Lithuanians gave such presents as a hundred most beautiful words, a hundred woven sashes, a hundred hearts, and so on and so on. In the parties, the villages sought to show an unbroken connection with their homeland. It was symbolized by black rye bread. 
A loaf of bread would be consecrated when people gathered for festive mass at church and then sliced and handed out. Also, hot tea and biscuits would be served. The village of Gelaji in Panevizhi's district, the idea to knight a record length national scarf of independence arose, and hundreds of knighters joined it. It sounds a, a bit funny, but this activity also symbolized close neighborly ties, caring, and the warmth of home. As Jonas Mardosa noted, the celebration was not as universal as in, was not as universal as in previous years. When asked about uh, the 18th, 16th February, Lithuanians earlier would say they were indifferent to it. For them, it was just a day with free events. According to the ethnologist, the passivity of non-participation of some citizens was influenced by the gap between official and entertainment parts of the celebration. However, this should not be the case because festive entertainment is a medium which can stimulate the growth of the seedlings of civil society from the early age. In 2018, official events were enriched by people's ideas, so a number of previously passive citizens took an active part in them. It was not only 16 February that Lithuanians celebrated cheerfully and ingenuously. Other important days uh, were also more festive than before, with concerts, exhibitions, freedom races, etc. The Centenary Song Festival in July, dedicated to the consolidation of all compatriots, both those in Lithuania and abroad, also became an impressive event. And now, the year 219, the year of remembrance of the way to the freedom. This year, when the 13th anniversary of the Baltic Way was marked, was also very special as the jubilee of the way to the freedom approached, the national upsurge of that time was remembered, and the feelings of the people who had stood holding hands in the living chain revived. According to politician scientist Alexandra Stromas, the Soviet communist regime had no censor supporters. It persisted only because of oppression and inertia. Almost each more aware citizen of this country was a potential dissident. Non-Russian citizens who all dreamed of independence or autonomy were particularly anti-Soviet. Thus, nationalism manifested itself as a liberating force that helped the occupied nations to restore their independence. Standing in the Baltic chain, people felt spiritually stronger, having finally got rid and fear and daring to turn into open dissidents. They felt joy at the opportunity to express their ethnic identity and to take responsibility for building their own future without the helping of the big brother. In Leonidas Donsky's words, nationalism destroyed empires. Its exploding and reshaping potential deeply affected and hastened the breakup of the former Soviet Union. 
In the late 80s, Lithuania's national rebirth movement, Sayudis, and its singing revolution not only revived the sp spirit of the epoch of the springtime of the peoples, though slogan for you and our freedom was raised as a banner, but also became a test of the Soviet polis policy of glasnost and perestroika. The first breakaway republic in the former Soviet Union, Lithuania, came to embody the historic triumph of nationalism over forced internationalism, which is a high point of the modern Lithuanian history. For the whole life of restored Lithuania, the Baltic chain has remained an example of the patriotic celebration and aspiration. The large numbers of arriving people reminded observation, observers of a flowing river, even a sea. When I reached a motorway, I saw an Unexpected view. It looked like a whole Lithuania, all its people gathered to encircle it. It was majestic. I was looking at a line of happy people stretching for tens of kilometers, who, having forgotten their daily worries, had one goal and aspiration. Many participants recall people's smiles and their glowing faces. And the culmination of the whole celebration, when those standing on the road joined hands, arises in the memories as an outbreak of emotions. As the people stood in the line, held their hands tightly and began to sing the anthem loudly, and in unison, Tears appeared in their eyes. There were lots of people of all ages. They congratulated one another and shook hands. Holding hands, they chanted Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and sang the anthem or the songs Lietuva Branki, Lithuania Dare. The song Vunda Jo Baltia, The Baltic is Awaking, composed specially for this event and often broadcast, broadcast on radio and television, is also a strong memory of the Baltic chain. It seemed important for the event to be attended by people of all generations, different nations and different social strata, which I doubt or the car and headed for the line in the Baltic chain. I was standing next to an elder doctor and an architect, and to my right stood an old man from the village and some three of village children who ran here across the field after their grandfather. People lit candles in memory of those loved ones who did not live to be part of the day. The candles symbolized the, those who died, were deported, or had to emigrate. The overall, overall impact of the event was also very important. Its photos, video footage, journalists, articles, and politicians' comments spread all over the world. The, tens, the 10 years later, Vitotas Landsbergis wrote the following about the importance of that day. There were perhaps up to two million participants of the Baltic chain and tens if not hundreds of millions of indirect participants who watched the largest or ge geographically longest manifestation on TV screens. Therefore, the process of the Baltic chain should not be measured in kilometers. Of course, the living chain stretching over 600 kilometers along the motorways is also a record, but it is no less important to remember and appreciate the giant hands and spirit. Millions of Lithuanians, Latvians, and Estonians who went to the Baltic chain or held their breath on the radio or in front of their TV sets, 
defended their dignity and rejected the slavery of her at that time. The Baltic chain is still living history, well preserved in the memory of the older generation of the and the father idea arose to do it again on the occasion of its 13th anniversary. In 2019, public organizations called people to take part in the repetition of history. The Baltic chain is us. According to the organizers, the living chain of people stretched from Gediminas Hill for about 12 kilometers in Vilnius, where over 16,000 people percent. Many people also gathered in Soloce on the Lithuanian-Latvian border, where Gitanas Nauseda and Egil Sulevits, residents of Lithuania and Latvia, met, and a festive concert was held. One year later, in August of uh, 2020, Lithuanians formed a human chain again. This chain called the Freedom Way stretched from Cathedral Square in Vilnius to Madininki, a town close to the Belarusian border, in solidarity with Belarus, civil society fighting for democratic changes in the country. Some participants in this symbolic events wondered if the spirit of liberation movement and our unity of that time still exist or they have disappeared. Looking at the fluttering tricolors and joint singing of the national anthem at patriotic festival, the answer to this question is that former unity has not disappeared. The symbolic events of the Sayadis era are always with us. They have become our living tradition. They transform into festival, festive customs of our public holidays and memorable days. Lithuanians are proud of having taken part in the peaceful protests of expressing their patriotic feelings in a peaceful, non-violent way, and of passing this way of expressing their views and political aspirations to the future generations. Speaking about uh, protests in Belarus, we can notice the similar traces, the importance of creativity of participants. According to the Belarusian journalist Franak Vecharka, the protest is creative. People use technologies and arts. Every protest looks like the festival. It is an engaging and fun. And maybe therefore, therefore the protest, uh, protests in Belarus, they have strength and uh, they don't stop. Thank you for attention. Thank you. Austria. So now we have a, a few minutes uh, for questions. Could you please somebody from from our from our audience? No questions and no questions online. So that is my question, Austria, about nationalism. You uh, quoted uh, Leonidas Donskis um, and um, uh, compared um, events uh, in 1990 or. Uh, during the Saudis time and nowadays. So, but uh, what do you feel, what is the distinction between uh, nationalism expression in Saudis time and uh, nowadays? Of course, everything is changing 
and uh, we always are creating our history and also we are creating our tradition. But I was more focu focu focused not on those changes. I was interested uh, with those uh, elements uh, which became a tradition. Uh, they became a part of our customs. Uh, maybe there should be more changes, more innovations. Uh, there were so many songs composed uh, on the side this time. But I was uh, a little bit surprised that, that uh, we did not hear new songs composed uh, um, on the occasion of the 13th anniversary of it. The songs uh, composed earlier were sung during the commemoration event. Uh, the celebrations were very warm and very creative in the countryside. But in Vilnius, uh, in the intellectual communities, they were more official. Uh, maybe the fall, uh, we did not hear new songs. And or maybe there, there is not uh, as, as uh, strong, uh, such a strong expression of uh, that uh, liberating nationalism of nowadays. <laughs> that uh, would be my suggestion. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other question? No, thank you, Austin. <laughs> Our next presentation is by um, Haris Efemio. Am I right with your name? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Haris is from the University of Music and Performing Arts uh, in Graz, Austria. And his presentation is about um, another rebirth, um, about uh, another revolution um, in 1968, the German student movement uh, of that time, and um, German composers, uh, composer Hans Werner Hens's development on, of his musical language at the time. So. So, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Everything's fine? Yeah. So from the left side, uh, from Zoom, okay, okay. So um, we see from the left side up uh, one uh, picture from Gericho, the Raft of Medusa. From the right side, we see Che Guevara. Uh, down left, we see Hans Werner Henze with some uh, kids in Montepulciano in Italy. And at the right side, we see police beating people. So uh, I promise you at the end of the lecture, everything will make sense. Um, music and protest, the year 1968. Uh, everything is actually uh, clear and there is a lot of literature speaking about that, as you see, not only in the left side, uh, music and protest in generally, uh, but also at the right side in Germany. Uh, we have also, as you see here from the left side, uh, books speaking also about uh, music in 1968 in France. And as you see here, you see the red flag. And from the right side, you see that the guy who is at the upper part of this raft uh, uh, wears uh, wings also a red uh, flag, a red um, tissue. So somehow those two uh, are being related um, according to the um, um, oratorium of Hans Werner Henze, uh, Das Floss de Medusa, the raft of Medusa composed and performed 1968 with a huge uh, scandal. 
Um, Hans Werner Henze is one of the uh, greatest uh, composers of the second half of uh, the 20th century and actually in German speaking countries is the person that uh, connects political act activism uh, with music. Uh, as I've said, 1968, it was the, in December or 9th of December, uh, took, let's say, took uh, in brackets the uh, premiere of this piece, Place. Uh, but actually, uh, the music activism of uh, Hans Werner Henze took also place to the pieces that you see here. I want also to emphasize here the um, pieces of 1966 until 1967, there were concertos. Until now, the pieces that he composed were composed in the traditional way of, okay, I have a dialectic between the soloist and the orchestra. Mathematic material goes from, from the soloist to the orchestra and back. Here we have now the struggle of, of the individual, of the individual, which is now the bass player or the piano player. And from the other side, we have the orchestra. The individual, which is the person who doesn't want to follow capitalism, and from the other side, the mass that pushes you to this uh, capitalistic way of, of living that Henze and many other intellectuals of this time didn't want to. After uh, the Flos de Medusa, we have uh, three very famous pieces of him that actually uh, the modernistic elements of his music uh, quasi exploded, especially to this El Himaron and, like, and uh, La Cubana. Um, das Flos de Medusa, as we see here, is a piece that polarized not only the musicians and the polit politicians and the newspapers, but also the musicologists. Uh, many of those, they were focusing on the outer layers of this piece. For example, um, at the ending, when this uh, guy with the red tissue is being rescued and comes back to France to say, to, to make public this scandal, which uh, in a couple of minutes I will explain you. Um, at this moment, um, Hense sees to this person, uh, to this Jean Charles, the name of this person, he sees uh, himself against the capitalism. He sees the um, socialistic uh, composer that composes in a new um, environment that he faced uh, in Cuba, for example, a couple of years ago, uh, before uh, Stalin and Soviet Union quasi uh, uh, um, took under their force this country. As you see here, this is a small, um, let's say, uh, um, compilation of the um, literature. Uh, the, practically, we don't have any monography about this piece, and uh, most of them, except Peterson's uh, uh, work, the, there's a second last, uh, speak about the outer layers of the piece, and actually none of those uh, um, um, none of those uh, uh, treaties and 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 and, and articles uh, speak about the music itself. Uh, there are even uh, didactical concepts, how to bring to the German school this oratorium. Uh, nevertheless, all of those, they, um, they, they don't go so deep to this issue. So uh, my goal today uh, is to show some elements of the musical language of uh, Hans Werner Henze, how they were before, how they were to this uh, crucial piece and how they developed uh, later. Uh, firstly, I will say a little bit about the story. We are now in the year 1815, and there are three, four ships um, um, traveling from France to uh, Central Africa. And, you know, one of those uh, uh, has a havari and, and sinks. Um, the um, captain, the generals and the officers and the priests are taking the, um, the boats, the rescuing boats, and they are leaving. And quasi they leave uh, the rest of 175 people. They are making just a raft from this uh, ship. And actually, they, most of them, they didn't survive. Uh, after the first days, uh, people died. After a couple of days, uh, there were some fights between uh, the um, um, 
those poor people and 50 of them died. And the reason was uh, who is going to, to, to get the uh, cask of water, the last water of this uh, uh, raft. And unfortunately, due to this occasion, the, the cask fall into the water and the water was lost. So, but nevertheless, 50 people died like this. And after that, they started with cannibalism because that was the only way to survive. And at the end, 12 survived. And then as we have seen to this picture, one of those is winking and they were rescued. From those, nine died. So only two or three came back to France and they wanted to make it public. So for Hans Benahense, this guy that comes back, this Jean Charles, uh, is actually the, um, um, the individual uh, that wants to resist against the capitalism, that has, doesn't want to become a communist, but wants in a way, in an utopian socialism, to, uh, to be a, an artist in the way that he wants to, and not in the way that the interdance of the concerts or the politicians want from him. How does this work function? This is now um, one, uh, um, one, let's say, um, one, no, that's not the premiere, but that's one concert that took place 2017 in Germany. We see from the right side, a lady with the name La Morte. This is the death. So death is a personality that, that, that lives out, outside of our space time. The ties that for this person, there is no past, future and present. And this person knows that the people will die. So she's from the right side. Um, Henze was influenced from Orphée, a film of Jean Cocteau, 1950. And the person of Orphée, here as we see, is the death. And also this death uh, lives outside of our space time where there is no future and present, as I have said. Our Jean Charles, the guy with the, with, who's winking the red uh, tissue, is from the left side. Here is the guy. And in the middle is Haron, the speaker. Uh, now we are in the second half of 20th century and it is not, we cannot take it for granted that in one oratorio we will have one speaker. In 20th century, uh, the composer that brought again the function of the, um, of the speaker to one oratorio was Igor Stravinsky with famous Oedipus Rex. He writes, that's not a coincidence, that Jean Cocteau wrote the text so he was also influenced by his, uh, his work. And at the same time, Cocteau introduced the speaker who appears in modern dress, not in an ancient um, costume. Um, we are now in, in ancient Thebes, Oedipus Rex, and now we have two persons, Oedipus and Creon, uh, and uh, somehow, in a specific way, their music is being composed uh, by Stravinsky, which deals also with Hentzes, Das uh, the Medusa. Now something uh, in a deeper understanding of the piece. When La Morte uh, sings, uh, mostly strings uh, play, right side. Jean Charles is, a, is an alive person, so he's being accompanied by winds. Winds, they blow. If you blow something, you're alive. And choir is at the back side. Normally, it should be everything now at the left side, they're alive. And when they die during those 17, 20 days, they go to the right side, to the dead. If they're alive, they sing German. If they are dead, they sing Latin. Verses, for example, from Divina Commedia. From where does it come from? From another opera of Hans Werner Henze of the year 1961, with the name Elegy for Young Lovers. After the, the premiere of this piece, the German press said that Hans Werner Henze is Richard III, Richard Richard the Dritte. First, Richard was Richard Wagner, Richard Strauss, and after the Second World War, where is our Richard? Now, with this, Henze became, let's say, at the same level for the German press, like Richard Strauss and Richard Wagner. So, there we have a poet, a Mittenhofer, and everybody around him must do things so as to please him, so as to write the perfect poem, oversimplified the whole plot of the piece.
But as we see here, uh, there are main instruments. Every person, when he uh, sings, some instruments are, are, have a characteristic timbre. So we see, for example, Mittenhofer has brasses, and uh, Tony and Elizabeth, the young lovers, they have viola and violin. We see here how he changes the, the, the timbre of, 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 of the design of the sound. We go now to Medusa's uh, false echoes. Now we know what's all, all approximately what's about. Now let's see what is happening. We are now in number four, and there, for the first time, after the first people died, uh, Jean Charles hears some voices. So that's La Morte, who says to him, come to me, you're going to die. She knows that he will die, but he doesn't know. He thinks he's crazy that he listens echoes, but those echoes are false. Now we see here, to the upper part, La Morte, and to the low part, Jean Charles. So when uh, uh, Jean Charles sings Riff S, they called me, it goes downwards and it is a diminished seventh, nine semitones down. But when La Morte answers, it sounds like a major sixth, but it is upwards. So you could continue like this now uh, due to the lack of time. You could see here that there are so uh, many correlations between of that, what Jean Charles sings and what La Morte answers and that need, need to be investigated. So the first investigation that I have done uh, was just to take um, the intervals that they sing and count them in semitones. Minus if it is downwards, up a plus if it is upwards. So we see here the number minus four and minus nine. La Morte blue here, plus nine. So at the right side, I tried with a graphic to put those numbers uh, in, a, in a graphic, as I have said. So as we see here on the left side, the score on the right side, the intervals that they sing in numbers, plus and minuses. So as we see here during the first 10, 11 uh, bars, they don't communicate, they don't meet each other. One sings intervals upwards, other uh, downwards. One has a small melody upwards, the other has a melody downwards. So now here is the intervals minus four, minus nine, and here is plus nine. So why do I do this? Because then we see the complete number four. So as we see here, uh, they don't meet at all. There are only two, two times that they meet, as we see here. And to both times, uh, there is something specific in the text. The agony of the humanity is what uh, Hense sings. And um, um, here what uh, um, Lamotte answers is, you will not survive. One says, I have agony. And they said, you will not survive. And there are this, the two, um, let's say, um, points of the parts of the piece that they meet together. Uh, as I have said uh, before, uh, Hans, Hans Werner had a right to his memoirs that everything that he was doing in an abstract way before, he does now in a concrete way. For example, in this elegy, there is one lady, a Hilda, who is a little bit a crazy one and has some visions. So this is the beginning of elegy, and these are the first five bars. And this Hilda sings uh, six uh, phrases here uh, with different six different colors. Here I tried to put note heads only to those, um, to those phrases. I'm not interested now to the rhythm, to the parameter of the rhythm. And here's the complete number one. And hence I writes, okay, for Hilda, I used a modern, he said modern intervals. So let's see which are those modern intervals. Here's a statistic analysis of all intervals. And that's what we see here is the unison. He repeats notes. Okay, if I delete now, omit this uh, interval, we see all of a sudden then three tones upwards and three tones uh, downwards, they, um, they, uh, they play a dominant role. So actually, really he has an idea how to use the number of the intervals and which intervals to each person. 
Now is number two, is Caroline and Doctor, that they say what they should do today with uh, the poet, so as he to be pleased, so as he to write maybe a couple of words. And as we see, red marked, uh, there are very few tritones. So all of these things, if I go back maybe, uh, I couldn't find uh, something according to the text to justify the usage of a tritone. So it was everything a little bit in an abstract way. As we have seen in Hans Werner Hens's work, it was different. Now I tried also to put those intervals to our statistical, not to our statistical, to our graphical analysis. Uh, if you see a point, means that it is an interval. Plus 15, for example, here, I don't know if you see the mouse. No, you don't see Plus 15 means that he jumps 15 semitones up. If you see minus 14, then he jumps to the other direction, 14. And at least what do I see are that at the beginning we have a lot of intervals, then it becomes a little bit settled to uh, semitones and repet repetitions, as we see here, then opens again and closes and opens and closes and opens. But every time those openings, they become smaller. I couldn't find anything in the text to justify why there is uh, a turning point. Okay, that was something in an abstract way that he has done. Now we are in Medusa and we are to number 10, where exactly then after the point that those 50 people died, each other fighting, and the water fall into the, uh, the fresh water fall into the ocean. That's it. They don't have anything to drink anymore. Everybody will die. So exactly there, where we have also similar waves that Jean Charles drinks. You are so stupid, drink. You don't have water, drink now the sun. You are so ill and drink now the time that you have. You have time left and drink this time. So those moments are the most crucial moments of number 10 and very, very powerful. And exactly there he uses those intervals as we see here. Uh, the same things we find, I conclude now in Oedipus Rex, but I don't see here anything. Um, I couldn't find anything, especially it was this blah, blah of Oedipus Rex arriving in Thebes saying, I will rescue you from the plague. And that's it. Uh, and there are also some um, concluding uh, here. There are also some parts of Oedipus Rex that look, they look and they sound a little bit like uh, Medusas, as you see here, those Ostinati and the choir. And here also the same Ostinati and the choir. Uh, due to a uh, lack of time, uh, maybe you will read after uh, a couple of months in the, um, in the publication further um, parameters of the musical language of uh, Hences dealing with Medusa. Instrumentation, which instruments do they play what? Do you double the voice of Jean Charles or you don't double? If you double it with another instrument, it's going to be more striking, the final result. If you don't, note. Uh, in uh, texture of the human voices, for example, he doesn't use any more apogaturas or, or some melismes that he uses. The tutti parts. Some, it is the struggle, like I've said before, between the individual and the capitalistic, you know, masses that they want to, to, to conquest you. And of course, composing for children. Uh, the, the children that they die here, they just sing in a calm way in, in Latin. And those things he was practicing later to his opera uh, uh, Policino uh, that he composed uh, a couple of decades later. So now here is Henze showing that the capitalistic composer is not in a, like Mittenhofer in one castle composer, but he's here at the society and helps young people to learn music and to inspire them to become musicians. Um, we know now Jean Charles and we know now Che Guevara because according to Hans Werner Henze, Che Guevara was this uh, guy that was winking Jean Charles. And of course, it was a huge scandal in the, um, in the premiere and the premiere never took place. We have only the recording of the uh, general rehearsal because the police came and started there really to beat people because they just were reacted according to this. So I would like to thank you for this for your attention. <laughs> 22 minutes. <laughs>
<laughs> we have eight minutes for questions. <laughs> Just perfect. Thank you, Harris. Uh, so, um, do we have any question online? No. So we still wait some questions. Uh, and uh, do you have uh, questions from the audience? Yes, Rima, please. Thank you, Harris, for your presentation. Uh, uh, I want to, to come back to your graphics uh, that you made, uh, this graphical expression of uh, sound scales. And I wonder, uh, looking at these uh, graphics, I see that there is a very conscious uh, tendency to symmet symmetry. Uh, where the unison, the, this uh, main, main tone, is like a central axis, and all the sound scale goes up and down uh, symmetrically. So I wonder, is it typical for Hans's wax, uh, other wax, not only those that you uh, have, sh uh, uh, have shown now, maybe it's typical for his compositional style? Uh, now that you made the question, I, the computer started to work and started to scan uh, <laughs> his memoirs, his writings that I've written, and as far as I see, the word symmetry doesn't come, uh, doesn't occur to his writings, and I could say maybe even the opposite. Uh, he doesn't like so much Webern with those symmetries. He finds them academic and capitalistic. So what is this? Yeah, don't ask me. Only he could answer. Uh, from the other side, he likes the way that uh, v uh, that Berg, for example, in uh, in his opera or in his violin Val concert, uses the row. So then there are no obvious um, placative um, symmetries. Mm -hmm. So this is what now from the scan. Uh, I need, of course, to check again, and that's an interesting point for my um, for my habilitation on this piece uh, to check what about the symmetries. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he doesn't he doesn't like those stuff. Maybe he does, but he doesn't say I use their symmetries. They are not so important for him because it, it is too structural. Mm -hmm. The past, let's say, the capitalistic past, is too obvious if you use such kind of symmetries. The socialistic composer of the future should use his personal language that he will uh, use for the for the well-being of the folk. This is what he says. Stand uh, update 1968. 2000, then he revised all his um, opinions about the ideal socialistic um, way of composing. Probably he seeks to be uh, such a composer, but, but uh, unconsciously maybe he can't escape exactly. from this exactly. structure. Exactly. Any other questions? So it really was very interesting. Uh, I um, I didn't know so so much things about uh, so many things about uh, Hans Werner Henze, and uh, even the fact that uh, he was so influenced by uh, Prague Spring. But he was elder generation. He was not a student as Ligeti was. Uh, Peter Etwersch was. Uh, at the age of student time, and he was influenced. And it's uh, it's understandable more because mm -hmm. he was young. Do you know any other um, uh, German composers who also was so involved in these events? They were composers of 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 of, of DDR. But as we heard in the um, in the in the keynote speaker, which I can justify also, uh, it is very. There are oratorio, or, or, oratorios that they were, that they were, let's say, uh, um, socialistic oratorios with a speaker. And, and then you have from the other side, Henze, that writes, let's say, also socialistic uh, oratorio, but they're completely different. The composers in the East, they needed to, 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 to follow specific norms. It's a little bit the situation like uh, like um, Shostakovich, but in a very milder way, but the same. In Western Germany, they were looking, composers, for example, 
I will bring you as an example what his friend uh, um, Stockhausen said. said, come on, uh, Heinze. He said to him, why are you doing that to yourself? Why do you compose and you try kids to bring how to play the recorder and the flute? Go and compose your new opera. He says, no, no, you're wrong. We, this is the, 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 the socialistic composer should do something for the folk. So, for example, to compose one opera that the kids that they play there, they will be so fascinated that later all of them, they will become musicians. And indeed, in Montepulciano, after this opera Policino, most of them became musicians, music teachers, violinists, and so on. So for him, that was um, the political aspect, considering, um, as far as I know, uh, Hense was the, the only one composer that was doing this so consequently, and he was a little bit, you know, the outsider. We must mention in the 60s also that he was also, um, um, he was also, he was, he, he was an outsider. Uh, at, at, he, at his, uh, his world, even though he was uh, composing for all possible famous orchestras and, and opera theaters. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Haris. And uh, our last presentation in this session is by Beata Boblinskene from the Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theater. And uh, her, uh, <laughs> her pre this presentation is, uh, yes, the renewal of uh, Gregorian chant as, uh, as a sign of political and cultural change in Lithuania. I, uh, I just would like to add that uh, Batanon is not only a researcher of Gregorian Khan, but also she is a singer, a member of um, Scola Gregoriana Vilnensis Ensemble. So please, Bata. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, so, um, I will speak now, uh, I will start speaking not uh, from the 1990, but from the 1989. <clears throat> the year of 1989 was a year of significant political and cultural changes in Lithuania. Uh, one of them, uh, the reconsecration. So, uh, the consecration of the Vilnius Cathedral on 5th uh, February 1989, which as a church had been closed in 1949, had a strong symbolic meaning not only for the faithful. In terms of the church music, the consecration led to formation of five cathedral cores, and one of them, paradoxically enough, because of the lack of the recent local tradition, became a choral schola for Latin monody, Schola Gregoriana Vilnensis. A guest performance of Le Chor Gregorien de Paris in 1989 inspired the establishment of such scholar in Vilnius. Through the friendship with the French chanters, Lithuanian choral novices got into contact with Solem Abbey, a Benedictine monastery in France, famous for the Gregorian chant studies and official chant editions for the Vatican, so-called Editio Vaticana. From Solem, Graduale Triplex, the official liturgical book of the Roman Riot, supplemented with news from medieval manuscripts, arrived to Vilnius. And this is how a recent branch of the research into and interpretation of Gregorian chant, the Gregorian semiology, entered Lithuania. Uh, Gregorian semiology developed by, developed by Solemn monk Dom Jean Cardin in the uh, uh, 60s and 70s uh, of the 20th century remained absolutely unknown in Lithuania until the end of the Cold War because of the country's cultural and political isolation uh, from the West that in turn caused uh, conservatism of the local church itself, even constitutions of the Second Vatican Council were hardly executed. On the other side, church music studies in an academic field were impossible to conduct due to ideological reasons. So I will try to discuss the renewal of a Gregorian chant practice in Vilnius as a sign of political and cultural change in Lithuania of the period. But first of all, uh, let me introduce um, the historical context. Uh, that maybe uh, will be um, 
interesting more for international audience. Uh, Lithuania was the last pagan country in Europe, as we know. We were Christianized in 1387, and it was initiated by Grand Duke of Lithuania and King of Poland, Vladislav II Jagiello, and his cousin, Duke Vitotas de Grid. Uh, the official adoption of the new religion, to be precise, of Roman Catholicism, was first of all the political act because Christians, representatives of the Western as well as of the Eastern Orthodox Church, had been present in Lithuania before that. For example, Franciscans settled in Vilnius already in 13, 14 centuries. There were even cases of the martyrdom of Franciscans in Vilnius in the early uh, 14th century. And there are testimonies in historical sources about some attempts by missionaries to come to our country earliest from the uh, 11th century. As, and as we know, the name of Lithuania as Litua was mentioned for the first time in the description of St. Bruno's, uh, who was a missionary deaf in 1009. From the other side, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania included many Orthodox Pravoslav territories of nowadays Ukraine, Belarusia, and so on. However, all the liturgical, all the liturgical practice in a large scale, we could say all the liturgical infrastructure, came to Lithuania with the official adoption of, uh, uh, of the Western Church. It means, beside the building of churches and founding of monasteries, that uh, liturgical books and chant manuscripts we are brought to Lithuania for celebrating the liturgy with all the components with the singing of Gregorian chant as well and by the way quite recently in August uh, Schola Gregoriana Vilniensis gave the concert with a program of the Gregorian chant from one of these old Vilnius manuscripts that is attributed to the 14th century and now I suggest to listen small uh, small extract from from this uh, uh, and uh, sorry how from this concert <laughs> some period of institutional rooting uh, and growing of the Catholic Church in Lithuania, but in general, the church music, uh, the Gregorian chant, uh, have passed all the same phases uh, there, uh, there as in other countries in Europe, uh, and uh, especially in Poland for the political and cultural reasons. Uh, because we had common state uh, after, after the personal union of Jagiello and his successors on the throne of Poland. Uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was established in 1969 and existed until 1795 when the state collapsed as a result of partition executed by Habsburg monarchy, Kingdom of Prussia and Russian Empire. Uh, the church administrative system was common for both countries as well. For example, the Vilnius diocese established in 1388 belonged to the Epi Episcopal See of Gniezno 
until uh, 1798. Later, as Lithuania uh, became part of the Russian Empire, Vilnius Diocese was subordinated to the metropolis of Mogilov. And in 1925, Vilnius Diocese got the rank of Archidiocese. And uh, so, uh, so it is until now. Uh, and the same official editions of liturgical and chant books um, uh, were mandatory for both countries. Uh, and of course, the uh, church was a very strong unifying factor, uh, political also. Uh, so, and we had common chanting traditions as well. And the difference between some traditions could occur uh, in respect of different monastic orders, but uh, for example, but not uh, in respect of geographical, some uh, geography. A uh, monodic chant during all this period was culti uh, cultivated by scholars. And scholar means the ensemble of cantors, people who are able to sing, not all members of community. So, and uh, uh, Gregorian chant was cultivated in monasteries, churches by priests, canons, monks during the liturgy, holy masses and officium, uh, liturgy of the hours, and of course in Latin, uh, official language of the church. We know that in parallel in churches during this time, during this period, uh, was performed music, um, music uh, of, of this period, Baroque music, classical music, romantic music, uh, the local and national languages entered the liturgy with the Protestantism. Um, so Gregorian chant had its better and worse periods, but it survived as an official musical form of Roman Catholic Church. And um, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the interest to the Gregorian chant rose again. The old monodic chant interested the Lithuanian musicians as well. Uh, Lithuanian church musicians of the beginning of the century, such as composers, organists, and core conductors Czesław Sosnowsk and, and Józef Snowyalis, uh, were affected by broader European movements of sacred music, such as uh, Cetilianism, Regensburg School, uh, in case of Snowyalis. Sosnowsk was interested in some new approaches to Gregorian chant that were promoted in Rome, Vatican, by Pope. Uh, commonly known that in 1903, Pope Pius X issued the famous motto proprio, special document, called Strale Solicitudini, uh, that detailed regulations for the performance of music in the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope announced a return to early musical style, styles and to Gregorian monody. Pius X uh, chose uh, Joseph Potier, Benedictine monk from Salem, to supervise the new editions of chant and uh, chant books, and it led to the official adoption of the Solemn edition of Gregorian chant. And there we are already close to the contemporary situation of Gregorian chant studies and interpretation. And it is worth to mention that in 1926, priest and musicologist Theodorus Brazis issued in Konas the handbook for Gregorian chant, Gedoima Mokikla, the school of chanting. And uh, the liturgical chant books were used and edited in Lithuania, for example, Cantionale Protota Provincia Ecclesiastica Lituana in 1932. Uh, and uh, so we had in this interwar period, uh, so to say, normal development of church music. And uh, church music was teached also in the Lithuanian Conservatory. Yeah. And everything had changed in... 1940, when began the Soviet occupation. From 1941 to 44, there was a Nazi occupation, actually the Second World War in Lithuania. After that, in 1944, started the Second Soviet occupation. For church as an institution, the most dramatically change occurred in 1948 and 49 when the solution of monasteries closure of churches started. In parenthesis, we could add that the second big wave of Soviet deportations of people uh, to Siberia, uh, Gulag, took place also in 1948. Uh, 
and the big fight of Soviet ideologists against formalism in art began in the same year. The Vilnius Cathedral was closed in 1949. Luckily enough, the cathedral was converted into the art gallery. Uh, by the way, in 1969, the organ was restored, uh, in, in cathedral was restored organ by one German company, and the uh, cathedral began to function also as a concert hall for chamber or and organ performances. Uh, and it is the reason, by the way, why today we have good instrument in our cathedral. The choral scholar as a liturgical ensemble, of course, couldn't exist in non-functioning churches. On the other hand, any studies of church music in academic field uh, uh, were impossible due to the ideological restrictions. Of course, some studies as early music research we are conducted, but uh, it is impossible to investigate in the whole uh, amount and interpret the liturgical music without context of the church itself. Uh, the Soviet occupation meant in 1940 for Lithuania the civilization and civilizational turn backwards into the other mentality and cultural realm. So the restoration of the independence in 1990 uh, meant the return to the European or Western, so to say, civilization. And as one of the signs of uh, this return was the renewal of Gregorian chant tradition in the church. Of course, it would be incorrect to say that Gregorian chant uh, disappeared from churches, uh, from liturgy during the Soviet period. Uh, easy melodic formulas as prefaces of priests sung uh, sung uh, prayers like Kyria or Sanctus, we are performed during the masses, but more elaborated repertoire for cantors for scholar didn't exist in the liturgical reality of that time. So now, now I suggest to listen one example of such uh, um, uh, of singing of priests in, in this, uh, so to say, old style. Uh, Soviet style, but this is uh, the exact extract from the uh, from the uh, cathedral reconsecration mass in 1989. <laughs> Therefore, the formation of Gregorian Schola in 1989 in Vilnius Cathedral that had been reconsecrated in, in the same year was a novelty and even some maybe exoticism in the context of the real church music repertoire of that period in Vilnius and in Lithuania. The history started, as I have mentioned, when the uh, Gregorian choir from Paris gave a guest performance in Vilnius Cathedral and sang Gregorian repertoire. Young Lithuanian enthusiasts, uh, through the friendship with the French whore, got into contact with Solem Abbey and, among other good things, uh, received an official liturgical book uh, with news, Graduale Triplex. Uh, so, and uh, so it was, um, it was uh, so, and this is how, how uh, I, as I have mentioned, the Gregorian semiology entered Lithuania. 
Uh, at the beginning, uh, Lithuanian Gregorianists, we are called Cantores, Chorales, Capelle, Sancte, Casimiri, uh, and it was the male group. Uh, a, a girls group uh, joined a few years later, and in 1994, the entity became a, a Gregorian choir, Schola Gregoriana Vilnensis. And in this period, in, in the 90s, um, Gregorian scholars, we are formed in other Lithuanian cities as well, in Kaunas, Klipa, Dešuli, and other cities. And now, for example, in Vilnius, uh, we have uh, several scholars. Nevertheless, Schola Gregoriana Vilnensis institutionally is the most stable, uh, maybe, among all uh, scholars and covers a wider range of activities, not only singing during the Mass uh, every Sunday for 30 years already. The courses of a Gregorian chant are organized every summer. The Schola main maintains relationship with international organizations and institutions of the Gregorian chant, such as ISGRE, the International Society for Studies of Gregorian Chant, that aims to research and perform uh, uh, Gregorian chant in the spirit of the founder and Gregorian uh, of Gregorian semiology, Jean Cardin. Uh, Schola Gregoriana Milnensis maintain relations with other scholars in Lithuania and abroad, and of course with Solem. And it is, should be mentioned that it was the community of the Schola that made a great uh, contribution when Solem founded a Benedictine monastery in Palendra in Lithuania in 1994. The consecration of the new monastery took place in 2001. Even the uh, current prior of the Palendrai Monastery, Kazimieras Milošavičius, is a former member of the choir. <clears throat> Uh, approaching uh, the conclusions, one could say that the formation of the monodic scholar in 1989 in the Vilnius Cathedral can be considered historically at the renewal and continuation of the old chanting tradition uh, dating back to the days of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. On the other hand, Schola Gregoriana Vilnensis, as such in the 90s, was, uh, in the aesthetic point of view, the product of solemn tradition, uh, if we could uh, say in such way. And maybe only now, in the recent decade, Lithuanian Gregorianists in the singing practice rediscover the heritage of our own local tradition of Gregorian chant, but I would say that it is the result of the influence of the more general European trends of Gregorian studies that are focused on the discovering uh, unknown sources, unstudied manuscript. Uh, from the perspective of the recent 30 years, one can claim that the renewal of the interest of Gregorian chant in the 90s helped us to return to the, path or to the path of practices and studies of the liturgical music from which we had been eliminated for a half of a century. Uh, the renewal of Gregorian chant practice in Vilnius was uh, a sign of political and cultural change in Lithuania of the period because, first, uh, it was a sign of the restored, uh, restored freedom of religion and human rights in the whole. Uh, you could, without harming your career or reputation, go to church and, uh, for example, sing in the choir. Second, it was a real sign for the fall of the Iron Curtain and of the opening state borders. It was possible for, so to say, ordinary people without any special permissions, of course with visa, to go abroad, uh, in this concrete uh, uh, case, to the France. Um, so ironically, but now we can't go abroad again. And uh, third, it was a sign for the change in the field of official legitimated culture, where uh, could appear the church music after decades of its marginalization. And at the final court of my paper, uh, let us listen to the recording of Schola Gregoriana Vilnensis, a uh, very, very small extract.
for your attention. Thank you, Bata. And uh, now our questions. Do you have any questions? And uh, we have no questions online. Please, Auster, uh, just a second for a microphone will come to you. Thank you, Beata. We, are, we can hardly imagine that uh, church music could be great innovation after the oppression, after the long Soviet time. And I remember that uh, it was uh, something very inspiring when church music was included in, into the repertoire of festival, Gaida festival, into the program of official event, and uh, the concerts were held in the church. You told already that uh, The, the style came back, and uh, the same was with the gospel. Gospel was also big innovation, uh, something new. Maybe it was a representation of a so-called American dream. And uh, the style was no noticeable in the songs of Gintautas, Abarius, Gintari, Otakaite, and other songwriters. And um, I wanted to ask about uh, Catholic singing in the national liberation movement. Uh, what uh, songs uh, maybe were influenced uh, by church music? Uh, no, in in this, uh, if we um, uh, so the popular songs, uh, religious songs was, for example, was Lithuanian songs, for example, Maria, Maria, yes, we know, and uh, other anthems, maybe religious anthems. Um, Latin songs uh, maybe didn't function in this uh, so very very um, this liberating movement in 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 the, in the context of for example I don't know song contest and and so on and so on in the song festivals so. Um, Latin monodic music, this uh, old chant, of course, uh, it was, it, it is uh, maybe some, uh, some, uh, some niche, um, so music, uh, not for, for, for all people, no, not very popular. Um, yes, but uh, in, in this time, uh, in 90s, uh, uh, of course, um, the renewal of, uh, of interest for such music uh, so was a sign for this liberation. But this music itself, maybe, uh, not, yes, it was, uh, it, it, it was uh, sung in, in, during liturgy, during masses, but not maybe during very, very big uh, events. But, but, of course, when uh, the Pope uh, John Paul II uh, uh, visited Lithuania, of course, Schola Gregoriana Vilnensis sunk in this in, in, during the Mass, uh, during the maybe Mass in the, in the Ringis uh, Park. Uh, I don't remember very good. 
so it was some some maybe in some religious and big religious events yes scholar gregorian evidences and gregorian chant was uh, was sung but in um, in such in such very i don't know in such uh, events that occurred in in the streets yes uh, maybe not so maybe only maria maria popular hymn was a revolutionary chant no, yes yes yes, <laughs> yes in this <laughs> thank you austa and uh, my question is short better uh, you speak about the rebirth of Gregor uh, gregorian chant um, during the Sayyidis time and now you have a 30 years tradition uh, and uh, you as a singer is from the first cast, if, if we can say that. Uh, uh, what about sustainability? Do you have new members? Do you have young people who uh, have an interest uh, nowadays in Gregorian chant? Uh, yes, yes, we have new members. It doesn't mean that uh, all these people are young people. So, <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, interest is uh, we, uh, so we, we feel this interest. And um, now, of course, uh, the situation is uh, is different. Uh, in in this time, in 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 nineties. So the, the founders, so to say, of the choir was young. Now, now they are not so young. And um, but but uh, but we have maybe more knowledge uh, uh, how to perform, how to interpret the Gregorian chant. So we still have a uh, no. It's not a question. Thank you for a fascinating paper. Was early Lithuanian music also revived in this period? This is a question from on, online. Mimi Mitchell is asking. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lithuanian music in 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 which early music, early Lithuanian. Yes, 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 and uh, uh, we can speak also as a parallel. Uh, um, so tendencies uh, in that time rose uh, the interest rose only to 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 this uh, to early music to performance of early music, and uh, and. Uh, in the whole, uh, there was a time when. Uh, um, when started, um, so interest to to maybe to to uh, many types of music that before that uh, maybe we can't or or we can't um, I don't know cultivate or maybe we have not we had not um, we had not contacts uh, for for the, for this interest or we had not knowledge for for this interest yes it, it is uh, parallel parallel tendencies mm -hmm. uh, uh, new interest for for early music and uh, so to say new interest uh, if, if we could say so to church music yes church music and organ music yes that was prohibited in so time yes yes and uh, mm -hmm. one more question I, I yes I one more question please microphone just very short uh, comment for your question um, at uh, in our days uh, there is one very popular uh, ensemble of young people Gile Stingumas church ensemble and they started as uh, Georgian uh, style singers but now they sing all styles and uh, different styles and folk folk singing and everything and even they were invited to sing for pope franciscus when when he visited vilnius so just okay thank you yes but it i can um, i can yeah. also commend this uh, because uh, mm, yeah, i know this ensemble but uh, the way they sing uh, so this may be also is this old chant gregorian chant so the style the manner is different and um, so we represent uh, so to say classical uh, maybe from solemn solemn tradition that that is based on solemn on on this gregorian 
and semiology and so on. And the uh, Listingumo uh, Shvantova is this ensemble. They maybe are more fascinated for for this um, another another school that uh, was um, founded by Perez, and it is uh, it it, it uh, has has uh, some similarities to traditional Corsican uh, singing. So and this is um, aesthetically in aesthetic point of view, this is different different aesthetics. So. We represent uh, this uh, different aesthetic. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So thank, thank you, Beata, for your presentation. Now we have a break and lunch, and um, we will come back uh, at two thirty p.m. this uh, in this uh, second room of the conference, and we will have two presentations by Odronia Juritite and Dirima Povilonenia. So thank you, thank you for your question online and thank you for your discussing uh, live. See you later. Welcome back to the second room of the international conference, Music and Change Before and After 1990. And uh, now we have, uh, we give a floor to Professor Odronia Juretite, a representative of the Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theatre. Odronia is a researcher of uh, the ballet history, especially Lithuanian ballet history. So her presentation is the variety of interpretations of Eduardas Balsis, the prominent Lithuanian composer, ballet, Agle, Zelchukaralienia. So, please. Thank you. Thank you, Rata. Dear colleagues, in the changed historical, political, and cultural context of the Lithuanian state and its cultural aesthetic principles, the goal of this paper is to reveal the choreographer's interest in, interest in Balsis music, which demonstrates a high level of its values and its enduring vitality. They are also conditions by Balsis libretto. Agle, the queen of serpents, alternatively Agle, the queen of grass snakes. In English, Agle three spruce. Uh, is one of the best known Lithuanian tales, also the poem fa fairy tale by Salome Neris, with many references to the Baltic mythology. The content of the Valley Agle has a manifold character. In short, it speaks of a clash of different worlds, uh, contempt and love for the other stranger, betrayal in the face of violence, inability to be happy, maybe like in Wagner's Law Angling. And it has a tragic finale, like a myth that exerts sincere love in transition to another state of existence in the universe, turning into threes. Agla transformed herself and her children into threes. Today, two versions of Balsis Ballet are performed in Lithuania. The author of the first is British choreographer George Williamson. The second is by Martina Srimakis. All in all, there are five interpretations of this Balsis ballet. Here we can also add the ballet screening based on Vitotas Griviska's production, the Lithuanian film ballet. I will show this uh, film, fragment of this film.
costume designer of film ballet Dala Mataitene. This is uh, also from, uh, from this film, Alodia Rusgaite and costumes. Ballet master Vito Tasgrivskas was a proponent of dramatic ballet. Soviet authorities approved of and cultivated the narrative realistic ballet called drama ballet. He focused on the consistent development of the plot and the acting of dancers and uh, strived to give ballet theater psychological dance and to enrich it emotionally. Balsis created a compelling symphonic score uh, for the ballet. The well uh, thought out system of late motifs uh, conveying the main lyric dramatic idea of a piece, the dynamic characterization of a personages, the elaborate lyrical scenes, and the ingenious orchestration fully revealed the talents of Balsis, a playwright and symphonist. Uh, Balsis developed the drama of the protagonist's feeling, feelings intensively, highlighting it, but uh, also did not avoid the realistic nature of the tale. Uh, the this production of Agle so leveling the tendencies of uh, musical renewal uh, was acceptable and even welcome in the context of the Lithuanian culture during Soviet occupation. It was praised by conductor Potashinskas and prima ballerina Leokadia Ashkelovichute, we saw in the screen. She emphasized that Grivitskas had always paid more attention to the uh, store line uh, directing uh, and theatrical uh, expression of roles than to, I could say, symphony dance. This is all test production by Grivitskas. Uh, the staging of Grivitskas and the subsequent productions of Agle revealed a greater or smaller conflict between music and choreography. Elegius Bukaitis interpretation was fundamentally different from Grivitskas staging, but both productions did not satisfy either the composer or the lovers of his music. On the one hand, Balsi's music had already advanced beyond the rather realistic concept of first production. On the other hand, Bukaitis' search of in innovative means was more closely related to the set by uh, Rimtotas Gibavichus than to the music and the moderately modern concept of Balsi's. The version of Egidius Domeka seemed very moderate after Bukaitis' experiments. The choreographic expression based on overly general, non-individual language of neoclassical dance. The choreography, which should play the major role in the Dali, was overshadowed by the music and the vivid sets created by Dala Mataitene. Nevertheless, given a lack of the national repertoire, at the end of the 20th century, this third production of Agle gave the audience a chance to enjoy Balsi's music that was excellently performed by the theater orchestra con <coughs> conducted by Jonas Alexa and to see the mature dancing of uh, Loretta Bartusevicute and Valdemaras Chlebinskas. <coughs> 
British choreographer Williamson chose the dynamic cough of eggless emotions and naive, curious girl, happy woman and mother as the priority of the, his interpretation, while its climax highlights her spiritual strengths. The choreograph's imagination was limited by his desire to tell a true story, on the other hand. This provoked the use of realistic uh, props and mise-en-scene, just like in earlier production, traditions and innovations do not match to be uh, convincing. In the context of contemporary realities, Agle, uh, queen, the queen of the snakes, an archaic narrative about innovation and loyalty uh, to one's choice, about violence in the staunch defense of all traditions, has become particularly relevant. Let's add the critique of uh, anthropocentrism or predictable then in the relationship between animals and humans toward a hybrid society uh, of the future. However, it is hardly possible to convey the multi-layered, tense and powerful energy of the myth in Bali, and what is more important, to understand it adequately. The range of the interpretations of the choreographers seems to uh, fluctuate between the poles, the poem fairy tale by Salome and Erins, and the old myth that did not achieve cohesion and remain unrelated. According to psychologists, uh, myths and tales have similarities and differences. Even in the face of the en encounter with the most wonderful things, tales are told simply and in an ordinary way as in real life. The more important difference between the two types of storytelling is the end. In myths, it is almost always tragic, while fairy tales have a happy end. Symbolically reflected psychological phenomena demonstrate the need to attain a higher stage of personality, the spiritual renewal. The lyric dramatic level of Balsi's score most closely combines the fairy tale and mythological motives of the libretto. It is consistently highlighted in the latest interpretation. In creating a new version of Balsi's ballet, choreographer Remakis openly shared his doubts about the search for the real road, according to uh, composer Balsis on Dali writing and staging. I quote, there are were temptations to look for social problems or mythological links between nature and man in the story of the Aglia. But I am glad that I resisted them and decided to find all the answers in Balsi's rich music. I sincerely tell the story the composer chose as I understand it, using his libretto. Using his libretto. And in it, I discovered Agla and Gilvena's legend of love. Remake's choreographic interpretation of Balsi's ballet is originally derived from the music and a new synergistic quality of ballet emerges. 
remake is trans transformed the emotional dramatic content encoded in Balsi's work into a modern dance that gave meaning to the vitality of the music which has become classical. Julia Stankevichu Te Agle, Mantas Czernetskas, Gilvinas. The main late motif of Agle sounds. The five productions of Agle Queen of Grassnecks reflect the tortuous process of the development of Lithuanian art and history, the changing scale of choreographic art values from narrative dramatic ballet uh, to more abstract dance theater, establishing the modern quality of his work for the 100th birth anniversary of Balsis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Otronia. Do we have any questions? Mm -hmm. So my question would be, about the third production by um, George Williamson. Uh, since we have, uh, you examined four productions and three of them are by Lithuanian choreographers. And uh, this one is um, by the personality outside without uh, any Lithuanian background. So what uh, did you mention in this uh, 
production something different from these Lithuanians? I think that uh, uh, for English uh, choreograph was uh, very difficult to dis to decide uh, tell the true story <laughs> like fairy tale or, or mythology this this very deep uh, sense of of existence of universe existence of of man and I I uh, think that is uh, the the same problem. Uh, it's um, we 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 saw in in an, another uh, four uh, three uh, Lithuanian uh, production, but he did it in one <laughs> one way, like uh, he under, understood and uh, there are many uh, nice, very, very impressive uh, moments in this interpretation, but uh, uh, lack of um, in, integ integration uh, between uh, uh, this, uh, no, I would say, two levels: uh, reality and and uh, and uh, myth. And this reality was uh, very very realistic in uh, Williamson's uh, uh, interpretation, more than in Grivitskas, I would say. Uh, I think uh, this is not not a good. Uh, <laughs> feature of this interpretation. Beata, just a, just a moment. Microphone is coming to you. Uh, thank you for your uh, paper. And very simple question. Was, uh, what is the favorite production? What is your favorite production <laughs> and why? Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> I uh, don't uh, don't uh, like uh, <laughs> to say in conferences <laughs> in in, in scholar discussion. discussion, but uh, I think you understand what uh, the the. And I uh, will uh, say uh, reason because remake is uh, uh, it's uh, the best one. Uh, another also not 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 so bad, but uh, like uh, synthetic um, art uh, ballet. Uh, in inter interpretation, this uh, this uh, realistic in realistic trends, uh, we now um, perceive like like archaic, like like mu museum uh, thing, uh, not not alive. And it's wonderful that this music uh, sounds not so often. Very very good quality music uh, of Balsis like uh, uh, in, in this synthesis, this remake is interpretation more modern, more modern than, than uh, it, it is in real. I, uh, I mean, Balsis music, it's, it's no, no uh, uh, new, new uh, qualities in, in this uh, uh, syn synthesis. Uh, and um, that is the reason uh, because uh, remake is uh, interpretation uh, is my my best best to choose. <laughs> thank you for your openness. <laughs> so thank you, Dronia. Thank and you. Uh, now we have another one. Another one. <laughs> another one. Lithuanian presentation. Rima Povilonienė. Uh, she is also a professor of um, Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theatre. Uh, she is a music theorist uh, and researcher, and uh, yeah, it will be sure, completely yeah. different stylistic uh, because uh, Udronia talked about neo-romantic Lithuanian music and staging, and uh, this is about uh, microtonal. Uh, the presentation calls um, expanding the sound borders on microtonal attempts in Lithuanian music. 
So please, Rima. Hello, everyone. My name is Rima Pavilonene, as Yurati already introduced me. And uh, I'm happy to make a presentation here while also working on the organizing this conference. It's not easy sometimes to to join uh, the organizing activity and scientific activity, but I yeah. will try. But we are grateful to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, what I want to, uh, to talk today about, this is uh, the topics uh, that I am working in uh, recent years. And my research is focused uh, nowadays on microtonal music composing and its phenomena in the creation by Lithuanian contemporary composers. The subject of this conference suggested me to get deeper into the situation before and after 80s and to examine particular cases of microtonal music manifestation. Uh, it is well known that the focus on microtones regained the attention already in the beginning of the 20th century. And we at that time may notice the increasing, uh, I would say increasing dissatisfaction with the limited possibilities of Western major minor system and the turn of music processes towards uh, abandonment of form and melody, the revision and extension of the diatonics, as well as the use of non-tempered scales and microintervals. The music creators started to talk about the exhaustion and tiredness of the 12-tone system. And uh, right at that time, Ivan Vishnagradsky, in his famous manual, recorded his statement that quarter tone is the future and basis of the modern music. Uh, to explain the transformations and changes in 12-tone music, starting the beginning of the 20th century, American composer and musicologist Julia, Julia Vance has proposed a concept of 12 systems. But despite the fact that the application of microintervals in music has experienced some kind of renaissance in the second half of the 20th century, however, at the very beginning of the 21st century, this American composer has raised a question, where are the microtones? As she stated, despite various and radical innovations and experiments in the field of music, the microtonality didn't firmly establish in the practice. The microtonal composition still remains a stranger for the majority of performers and general audiences. Experiencing more than 100 years of intense creative attention, the generalization of microtonal composing still remains under consideration. Today, the description of non-12-tone music is reflected in different concepts and attempts to systematize it because first of highly individualized technological, as well as each composer's aesthetic attitude, and second, of the diversity in application of different tunings based on such aspects as microtonal relationships, different divisions, acoustical properties of the harmonic series. And here I would present only a pair of different opinions. They represent uh, different starting points. For example, Julia Verns distinguishes two general ways of microtone integration. Uh, first one would be simply expansion and uh, the second one would be more elaborated rejection or correction of the established 12-tone equal temperament. I would assign the approach by Julia to the most common focus in microtonal music. The focus is on music interval and the division of the octave. On the opposite, I would provide the concept by Lithuanian composer Ritis Majulis, he puts forward the creative intention and points out that the composer who decides to deal with microtones 
should first make a choice whether he is going to use microtones as a decorative tool or as a structural element. Extending the latter observation by Majulis, I would like to provide a summary how microtones manifest in nowadays Lithuanian music. I would distinguish two ways that are supplementing each other. Uh, that should be non-systematic or earlier mentioned decorative, coloristic approach. And this is an accidental or random appearance of microtones seeking for the variety of timbral effects of sound, variety of sound effects. And it may include ornamentation, inflection of traditional tones. Also, it may include so-called uh, multiplication of unison when the main tone is surrounded by its uh, doppelgangers, uh, that is secondary tones, uh, but uh, attributed to the main tone field. Also, uh, here in this uh, trend, we may attribute emphasizing microtonal transition. It means inserting additional pitches in between the semitones and thus creating an effect of smooth and sleek and glissando. Also, here we may talk about aspiration of detuned or untuned, not clear or even false harmony, creating unclear chords seeking to escape from still potent remnants of classical tradition. And of course, here we may attribute purpose of stylization when inserting certain, certain tones and pitches in, that are typical for non-Western non harmonies. An example, use of haiku, uh, other orient scales and tunings. The second way I would call systematic way or structural constructive approach and I have in mind a particular type of logic and a system that is applied to the whole musical work. In this way, microinterval technique determines the whole form of the composition, and the microtonal architecture serves as the initial idea for the overall concept. And it may be described as employment of a certain scale that already exists or is specially designed. Also, it may be an application of certain tuning based on or with added microtones. In here we may talk also about glissando phenomena, but it may be treated as the overall model. That is the principle of glissando in parallel to certain compositional rules determines the whole structure of composition. So what about the certain examples in Lithuanian music? Uh, here I would like to make some, um, to point out some examples and some cases starting from the interwar period up to nowadays. In Lithuania, in few decades of the interwar, we may face a single but very bright and consistent case of quarter tone experiments in the creative work by Jeronimas Kaczynskas. He was Alois Haber's pupil at Prague Conservatoire and is regarded the first figure of microtonal music in Lithuania. He was an active advocate of microtonal music, attempted to establish the microtonal movement institutionally, published articles in local press. In 1933, Kaczynskas wrote his quarter tonal trio number no. one for trumpet, viola, and harmonium. This trio is regarded as one of the earliest examples of Lithuanian avant-garde music. However, Kaczynskas' intentions were canceled by the Second World War. He was forced to emigrate and none of Lithuanian composers had followed or took over his microtonal experiments. But on the other hand, starting from the 70s, we may see a new outset. Uh, 
It was rather a response, a reaction to the display of avant-garde concept in music in general. But looking from nowadays, I would distinguish two directions of microtonal manifestation that I would describe as decorative and structural approach. Up to the 1990s, we may note only very few attempts to employ microtonal elements. And among the earliest examples, uh, I would provide a subtle message by Vito Tasbarkauskas in the beginning of his composition monologue for Oboe, composed in 1970. In the early 60s, Vito Tasbarkauskas was one of the first in Lithuania to experiment with serial, aleatoric, collage, and other techniques. In the context of that time of official, politically moderate musical language, Barkowska's ideas boldly declare, declared the avant-garde. But in the 1970s, the composer moved towards more intuitive composition, aiming at the natural beauty of sound. Therefore, Quarter tones in his music was natural tool searching for the appropriate sound expression. The use of quarter tone accidental in the introduction of monologue may be described as sound coloring. The introduction is based on the oscillation around tone E. It is surrounded by single and double trills also, the composer uses bisbiglando and flageolets, the subtle scanding and descending semitone glissandos. And it is interesting that during the first transition from E to F, instead of regular glissando, Barkauskas recorded a quarter tone sharp, emphasizing the singularity of semitone transition. And I would say that such a treatment of transition in some sense had designed a very common way to apply microtonal pitches in future works by Lithuanian composers uh, in such a way like colorful tool. The same year, in 1970, Jurgis Josapaitis composed the symphonic poem Stained Glasses, and three years, three years later, he presented his Rex Symphony. Both scores colorfully employ the quarter tones. These works, to some extent, summarized the composer's youthful attempts to, under the influence of avant-garde. In his early creation, Josapaitis clearly tended to dodecaphonic, quarter tone, and aleatory experiments. But already his early works predicted a special attention to the sound color. Uh, Josapaitis has stated that the use of quarter tones in his scores was mainly a result of the desire to enhance the expression of sound. For example, to create a snaking sound mass in the strings in the beginning of Rex Symphony, besides emphasized glissandos and multi-yared hordes, Josapaitis invoked quarter tones. Another score by Jurgis Josapaitis, the second string quartet, is richly modeled with quarter tone sharps and flats and primarily in, intended to create smooth transitions and tinny trills. However, in this composition, I would highlight a consistent application of the whole 24 temperance scale and creating symmetrical and gradually expanding scales around precisely chosen central tones. For example, in the beginning, uh, tone B acts as the axis for symmetric scale in the range of two major seconds up and down. For the other attempt to use quarter tones at that time, I would provide fragments from Antanas Rakashu's creation. Looking at the scores by this composer, like his sonata for oboe solo and fifth symphony, 
<clears throat> we encounter various glissando with quarter tone accidentals that produce the smooth transition or create the oscillation around the single tone. The presented Lithuanian music examples from 70s and 80s mostly correspond to the first type of composing with microtones. That is decorative integration and exposes the sporadic steps in dominating tonal harmony. The decorative approach is dominating in Lithuanian works after 1990s up to recent days as well. For example, in the work of middle generation composer Marius Baranauskas, one could find the expansion of single tone seeking to create of uh, out of tune harmony. Such the expansion of unison is achieved adding microtones up and down. Some works by Onute Narbutaite are enriched with, with the colorful effects with microtones like ordinary glissando, vibrato, trills. They are recorded with the quarter tone accidentals. But to be complete, I have to single out some contemporary Lithuanian composers whom I would attribute to the systematic type. Here I may include the integral glissando technique in the works by Juste Janulite, also the manipulation with microtones as derivatives from spectral scales in Justina Repechkaite's works. And of course, we have to, uh, to talk about Ritis Majulis. The use of microinterlars is a distinct feature in the creation of this composer, already starting from the 80s and 90s. According to Lithuanian musicologist Grazina Donoravicine, the microdimension concept is most suitable for Majulis' style. Majulis' fascination with tone division started with whole tone scales and superimposed threads. Later, the composer turned to the micro world and a variety of semitone fractions. For example, in this slide, I provide a very condensed list of uh, Majulis' compositions that shows a rich variety of microtone examples. Majulis uses microtones in very tiny quantities, in example, only 3.3 cents, or he uses the quarter tone series, microtones of 20 cents, and so on. The very bright examples are composition Sibylla, Ayapayapam, Canon Menzurabilis, also a vocal composition Cumesum Parvulus, Schisma. For example, the choral composition Sibylla, uh, according to the text, Latin text by Pe Petronius for mixed choir, was composed in 1996 and it is an endless canon moving in round, like Majulis' other spiral canons. The composer arranged a one-page score representing this spiral movement. The initial motif microtonally envelops the central tone, then the motif is transposed in a sequence upwards and downwards. By using the consistent timbral progression, Majulis shapes a palindrome in variable density. An especially elaborated and sophisticated approach to canon technique and microtonal divisions is brightly presented in one of Majulis' most recent compositions. It is solipse for cello and electronic tape. The composition was intended for 32 cellos, one live performer, and 31 pre-recorded samples. The structure of the composition builds up, let's say, an image of mul multidimensional glissando. First, a polytemporal effect is achieved by gradually slowing down the tempo. Second, Starting with tone C, the melody descends in micro distances that are recorded in cents. 
Third, every next cello enters the same pitch C, but at a different tempo that is derived from the previous cello part. And fourth, despite every next cello entering with a slower tempo, the total duration of the performance is equal to the first live cello. And it means that every next cello pre-recorded cello part is digitally stretched to the prime duration. The Solipsis score is an example of a strongly technologized process of creation as well as performance. Due to very complicated and strict scores, Majulis has reduced the personality of performer to a nearly mechanical state, while the audience also encounters challenges. Also with the help of the computer, Majulis is able to operate maximally reduced intervals that are hardly perceptible by air. As Horst Peter has pointed out, the experiments with specially built psalteries revealed that the 112 tone is the limit suitable for practical purpose. However, there is no stop sign for Majulis, whose sound world is immersed deeply into microscopic tone divisions up to one cent. In Solipse Majulis, in his own words, has achieved the maximal purity of creative mind expression, obtaining a highly hypnotic music process. Moreover, the solid architecture of the score has collected inside the diversity of microtonal manipulations from the adoration of unison and refined transitions to overall glissando forming a microdimensional result. Finalizing my presentation, I would refer to Ritas Majulis, again, who, despite of being very consistent in composing with microtones, still assumes that microstructural composing has no established rules or standards. However, the work by Majulis stands in par parallel to the worldwide microtonal path. Nearly 30 years ago, in 1991, the Perspectives of New Music Journal initiated a fruitful discussion dedicated to the questions of microtonality in today music. And the editor of this forum, Douglas Keisler, then raised a question, why the interest in new tunings? So, let me reinterpret the original question by Douglas Keisler into why the interest in microtones. Evaluating the context, Keisler noted that interest links to the sphere of minimalism. Non-standard tunings offer a means to breathe new life into minimalism. Or could it be a search for flexibility in music, a desire to weave musical narrative, as editor Noah Kaplan remarked in the introductory text to the English translation of Vishnagradsky's manual? The evident focus of Lithuanian composers on the coloristic approach of microtones could also be an answer. Thus, summarizing the manifestation of microtones in Lithuanian works before and after 90s, I may state that the most common cases represent the ornamentation or inflection of traditional sounds and chord harmonies, and the application of transitional tones and special attention to glissando requiring expression of the microtonal composition. And on the other hand, only few authors maintain a consistent path in creating rationally constructed compositions, but yet they maintain the energy of expression. And if I have some extra one, two minutes, Yurata, if, you, if I may, I would like to present two sound examples that, that would show, one of them would show this um, colorful, 
uh, implementation of quarter tones, and the second one would show the total integral glissando effect. The first example would be Jurgis Josapaitis Rex Symphony, first part, beginning. Romantic style music is uh, ornamented with water tones uh, like uh, traditional, which is in the 12 tone. And the second example. I would uh, show you a, a fragment from uh, mentioned Majulis Solipse, uh, composed in 2018 for one live cello and 31 pre-recorded samples. The whole composition is based on a very slow transition from tone C downwards and making a uh, canon, making a uh, very um, tight, uh, I would say, network of 32 performers. Uh, all of them play the same, uh, the same melody, we would say, but uh, this is implemented in different tempos and uh, create such a um, cluster of um, slowing, uh, going downwards glissando. Example further. This example reminds also the uh, sunglasses by Juste Ionulite, where I would say total integral glissando is also like the, the main, uh, main element to compose the overall structure of the composition. So this is, uh, this is the juxtaposition of two different approaches. And uh, we would say that the first one uh, that I presented by Jurgis Josapaitis is more common than, uh, than this one by Ritis Majulis. But Ritis Majulis in this case is a very bright example. And he is one of the composers who, who, who keeps his path very consistently. Thank you for your attention. A, a, a remark from my side as a composer of micro, microtonal music. You are compo composing with microtones too? Uh, only. Only? Only, <laughs> only with microtones. Okay. Yeah, I mean, every piece has a, a system that they use with microtones. And they studied with by Georg Friedrich Haas, yeah. which is one of the biggest names of microtones. So I will disc uh, the remark is uh, why microtonal music didn't become so standard as it should have become. Like, you know, early music became, in the 80s, 90s, we started to rebuild new instruments, new techniques to play the violin, to play Bach, for example, and then today is the standard. You go, you study at least in Graz, where I teach, and you have this early music department, which is something normal. At the 90s, when I started to study, wasn't. Um, in similar case, now in microtonal music, if you want to compose, let's say, for the flute, there are specific fingerings, for example, but you mm -hmm. must learn yourself if you're a composer and not a flautist. And from the other side, you need a student or a musician who is excellent 
uh, I mean, he, 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 he finished with all his problems of, of intonation and fingerings. So he's ready now to play. So we didn't have such players. So for me, it was very hard to get new knowledge according to microtones. Because, you know, this fingering here functions well, but if you take another flirt, it doesn't. So as I see here, um, we have presented easy ways to play microtones, strings with a glissando, mm -hmm. or then you use an artificial way. You don't have musicians to do that. Uh, so simply, you need to sit yourself as a composer and to find musicians to play, and you need to have the musicians themselves. So we didn't have it in the 90s, so it was very difficult, but now we have. So every composition student now in Graz 2020 has the opportunity to learn because mm -hmm. we have musicians that they play. So it is the practical part, which is very, very difficult. You take, let's say, for example, the, the, the clarinet, and for each clarinet, the different fingerings, different. How will be the sound? Will it be uh, matte or will it be bright or will it be dark? You must try all of those stuff. So the students, or they will have someone, or they will not do this job. It's just simply a difficult job to do. So the easy part, let's say, is to make... Uh, it's not a critic on Mazulis. It's, it's a way to do that without taking the difficult part. It's finding its musician and testing mm -hmm. what he could do. And secondly, the musicians themselves. So uh, from the practical part, as a remark, this is the a reason why it didn't become so mm -hmm. mainstream. Yeah. yeah, yes, Harris, you are right. I, I would uh, add that, mm, yes, the, the lack of performers who professionally may perform this kind of music is the main problem why microtonal music is not so spread worldwide uh, in, in performances in, in the concert halls. Also, uh, missing such performances, the audience is not uh, well educated to, to listen to such music. We, we have to listen more, we have more concerts of such kind of music, and then as the audience, we will, we will be acceptable of, of such sound, of such harmony. Uh, uh, in uh, a year ago, in December, I was in Amsterdam. They organized Microfest, yeah. a one-day festival. And there was um, a special one-hour concert that presented the compositions by Hari Parch, composer who was uh, very affected with microtonal music, but also what he did. He modeled, he produced instruments mm -hmm. to that, that his music was performed, uh, was able to be performed. He also intended to create instruments. So missing the instruments is also the problem. So we have, we have at least not only performers, uh, the problem the problems are lacking performance, uh, performers, lacking the educated audience, lacking the instruments. And also Alois Haber, he had uh, his own piano, mm -hmm. uh, especially produced for him. Uh, I saw that the copy of that piano, not the copy, that piano in, in Amsterdam. It's really fascinating when you see the, the ordinary uh, uh, keyboard, but it is tuned in, in microtones, only one octave in, in all 88 uh, yeah. keys. <laughs> so it's uh, really fascinating when uh, the pianist is playing glissando in, this, uh, in all these keys, and this is only in the range of one oh, octave. Yeah. Yes. And I could mm -hmm. find a third way of composing microtones. For example, I hear, let's say, C, E flat a little higher, and A, and then one octave higher, B flat a little bit higher. And this is a sound. It doesn't need to be a coloring of another main sound, firstly, mm -hmm. and it doesn't need to have always to do with these overtones. It's just simply a sound, and mm -hmm. there, there are the sounds. So mm -hmm. this from the side of the composer, this Gehörschulung, this ear training of yes. microtonal for a composition student is something extremely difficult that almost no one does. Yeah. It is easy to have your, your Sibelius and you press the button and you hear this 
um, uh, temperate uh, sounds. Yes. Then, mm -hmm. then it is easy to go further. But what about the sound that you have in your mind? How to put on scores on a score? So it is also another possibility of composing. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I agree with you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both for the discussion mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much as well for your brilliant uh, presentation, point by point. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. So uh, we now have um, uh, half an hour a break and uh, at, um, at what time? At four, at, at at four, four o'clock at 4 p.m. we will have a keynote lecture um, room, room one. Not room one. Room yes. one, and uh, it will be Kevin C. Kernes. So we will come back in twenty-five minutes. Thank you for uh, listening us and watching us online, and thank you for being live. <laughs> thank you, Yurate. Right